Welcome to CS Guitars, the science of loud. You might remember a couple of videos back, I was working on restoring this 20th anniversary Squire Stratocaster, and I said at the end of that video I had plans to turn it into an HSH Super Strat in the style of the one Dave Murray used with Iron Maiden back in the 80s. As you can see, I've been working on just that. Well, this guitar isn't quite finished yet, to get it to this stage, I did have to design and wind these three pickups. I have a lot of footage of putting these pickups together, which gives me the ideal opportunity to address a plethora of questions asked by you, the viewers, on the fundamental science of pickups. How they work, how they are made, and what parameters and materials affect the final sound. There's a lot to cover, and I'm going to try and hit as many points as quickly as possible, but if you do still have questions at the end of this, leave them in the comments, and perhaps we'll do an even deeper dive somewhere in the future. But for now, let's get to winding. Let's start with the basics. We're talking about magnetic pickups here, the type that you typically find on electric guitars sitting underneath the strings. Their purpose is to sense the vibrating string and convert that sensation into an electric signal that can be amplified. All magnetic pickups, regardless of shape or size, obey the same fundamental rules. They will be a coil of wire, extremely thin, insulated copper wrapped around itself thousands of times, which surrounds a magnet or a magnetised piece of metal. The steel cord strings sit within the magnetic field of the pickup, and when they vibrate, they interact with the field, and this movement perturbing the field induces an electric current in the coil. This tiny currents can then be amplified, affected, and blasted from a speaker, turning it back into sound, and that is basically how a magnetic pickup works, exploiting the physical relationship between magnetism and electricity to generate a useful signal. Much is made of the output of a pickup. Far too much, in my opinion. The output alone doesn't tell you much about the sound of the pickup, only how loud the signal will be. In real terms, the output is simply the voltage amplitude of the signal leaving the pickup. There are three physical parameters that determine the output of a pickup. 1. The total DC resistance of the coil. This is the one that everyone makes too much of a deal about. This is simply the resistance reading of the copper from start to end, and in itself is affected by two things. How much wire, simply how many turns around the bobbin did you make when winding it, and how thin is that wire. The thinner wire has more resistance per unit length than thicker wire, meaning that a coil wound with 43 gauge wire will have more resistance for the same number of turns compared to 42 gauge wire. So if you want more output from a pickup, one way to achieve that is to wind more copper and or use thinner wire. More resistance equals a larger output, less resistance equals a smaller output, however there is a significant tonal trade-off for doing this, which we will discuss later. 2. Magnetic strength. A magnet has many properties that are in play with a pickup, but the one that we want to focus on here is raw strength. How powerful is the magnet you use? A weaker magnet will have a weaker field, the strings will interact with it less, and the pickup will have a smaller output. A stronger magnet will have a stronger field, the strings will interact with it more, and the pickup will have a larger output. Coupled to this is the shape, size, and distribution of the pole pieces. These are what focus the magnetic field into the ideal shape to sense the string. They are the eyes of the pickup and will factor greatly into how the pickup sees the strings, but more on that later. 3. Proximity to the strings. The closer the pickup is to the strings, the more interaction the string has with the magnetic field and the larger the output will be. This is the single most effective thing you can do to change how your pickup sounds. If the pickup is too loud, saturated and there isn't enough clarity and detail, perhaps it's even distorting your clean channel, drop it down so the strings aren't oversaturating the coil. This is like setting the input level on your audio interface. You wouldn't typically want the signal bumping into the red, so you'd reduce the level. Pickups are the same. If you want a cleaner signal with more dynamic range, pull the pickups away from the strings. If you feel the pickups aren't driving your amp hard enough, raise them up. You can even do this individually for each string on many pickups. Humbuckers will typically have adjustable screw or hex head poles that you can raise or lower to get perfect string to string volume balance. It always surprises me how many people are completely unaware of this fact. You should be setting all of this properly to fine tune your pickup to your guitar. One big question people always have is, how do I know the correct height for my pickups? And the answer is simple, 
Use your ears. Listen to the sound being produced and adjust accordingly until the sound is balanced between all pickups and strings and the sound is the way that you want it to sound. Train your ears to actually listen and forget about numbers and measurements. How many millimetres away from the string your pickup is doesn't matter. What matters is how it sounds. When it sounds right, it is right. The only solid rule is that you don't want to bring the pickup so close to the string that the string can touch it in motion as this would result in a loud, ugly popping noise as the string contacts the magnet. Also, single coils tend to do a weird double note effect when they get too close to the string. Honestly, in my experience, I'm more often moving the pickup further away from the strings in order to retain clarity and detail in the sound. We've established that output isn't tone its signal level and all of the artefacts that brings when pushed too hot. So what does affect the sound and tone of a pickup? There are a great number of things, but by far the most significant is inductance. The physics behind inductance in a coil can be very complicated, non-linear and reliant on a great many factors. It's affected by the dimensions of the coil, the way the coil is packed together in cross-section, the magnetic flux of the current flowing through the coil and the properties of any magnet at the centre of it all. This won't be easy to explain quickly, but here goes. Let's imagine two different pickup coils. One is tall and narrow, the other is short and squat. For argument's sake, let's assume that the coils are all neatly packed in perfect rows. Both coils have the exact same number of turns and exactly the same DC resistance. What is different between them is the way the coil is distributed. Coil 1 has longer rows with fewer stacked on top of each other, while coil 2 has shorter rows with more stacked on top of each other. Both of these coils will have a different inductance and will sound completely different. This is a large part of the reason why a Strat style single coil will sound different from a humbucker used in coil split mode even if the coils have approximately the same output. Single coils are taller and narrower. That distribution gives them a clearer, brighter sound. The squatter coil of a humbucker bobbin generates a warmer, thicker sound. That is purely down to the dimensions of the coil changing the coil's inductance, but it doesn't stop there. Let's look at the cross section. We assumed before that the rows were all laid down neatly and perfectly, packing in the most uniform formation possible. This is only really physically achievable if the coil is wound by a computer-controlled machine that can feed the wire at a constant rate with a constant tension and has micron-perfect movements as it sweeps across the bobbin. However, most coils are wound by hand, by human operators, feeding the wire at inconsistent rates, with inconsistent tension and with the layers not forming up in perfect uniform arrangement. They are scattered and distribute in depth, not in perfect layers, but in clumps here and there. Even the tightly packed hand-wound coil won't have perfect uniformity and that once again changes the inductance of the coil. Machine-wound pickups will sound different to hand-wound pickups purely because of the human imperfections added into the system. Now you might think, well, perfect will sound better, right? But that's not the opinion of most players. Perfection is boring. The coils are often described as sterile or lacking in life. They work, but they are missing something to make them interesting to listen to. All the imperfections from a hand-wound pickup tend to add little nuances to the way the coil interacts with itself as current flows through it. The magnetic flux of the current interacting with the other coils and the magnet across the inconsistent layers gives a more lively sound, perhaps more dynamic in its response. It's more natural, more human. Of course, these terms are all intangible and subjective and will mean different things to different people and it may just be that we are used to hearing hand-wound coils. That's the way that they were done back in the 50s and 60s by teams of people on winding stations when there was very little control over replicating a coil perfectly. Each one sounded a little different to the next and each operator's coils had a different signature to the other. The most highly regarded and influential guitar music was made with these coils and the industry is obsessed with recapturing that very vintage magic. There's a lot to be said for doing it the way that it used to be done, as it's those tiny, immeasurable inconsistencies that really resonate with people. When I'm winding pickups and I want different models to sound different, I'm not just changing the number of turns and magnet type in the design document, I'm also actively winding the coil differently. 
For one type of pickup, I might try to wind the coil as evenly as possible. For another, I may deliberately try to distribute the coil more in the center in the beginning, and then more towards the edges towards the end. I even draw little hand movement diagrams in my notepad to remind me how I should feed the wire. We've seen that the dimension of the coil changes the inductance and therefore changes the sound. This goes double for massively overwinding a coil. As we wind more and more copper onto the coil to achieve a higher DC resistance, we are also layering more and more to the lateral dimension of the coil. As resistance increases, so too does the inductance, but not in a linear fashion. Inductance increases rapidly with resistance, and as it does so, the tonality of the coil changes. This can be simplified to the resonant peak, the most prominent frequency the coil will generate. A lower inductance coil will have a high resonant peak, and that's why thinner coils sound brighter. The more layers that get laid down, the thicker the coil becomes, the higher the inductance and the resonant peak drops. The coil starts to sound thicker and darker. Beyond around 16 kilo ohms, the inductance is typically so large that it starts to have a detrimental effect on the sound produced by the coil. The resonant peak drops far enough that the high frequency detail in the pickup is effectively lost. We'll just turn up the treble at the amp is usually the uninformed response here, but an amplifier doesn't magic high frequencies into existence when you turn up the treble control. It amplifies the high frequencies that were already there. If your pickup isn't generating high frequency content, then you're never going to be able to add it back in. The high frequency clarity and detail is what makes a pickup, especially under distortion, sound aggressive. Distortion itself is nothing more than high frequency overtones superimposed onto the signal. The pickup needs to have that level of detail or the distortion applied to it is going to sound like mud. It's all a balancing act, getting the output high enough to drive an amplifier hard and saturate the coil, but without losing too much of the high frequency detail and dynamic range. So a pickup with less DC resistance and a more powerful magnet might be the optimal solution for keeping the inductance low and the resonant peak high, perfect for a modern distortion application. Following on from inductance, the type and strength of a magnet also plays a part in the sound of a pickup. We know that the magnetic strength directly influences the output, but also interplays with the flux of the coil and affects the inductance, so choosing your magnet is more than just raw signal level. There are two main types of magnet used in pickups. Alneco magnets were the originals and probably still the most popular magnets used in pickup manufacture. They are an iron alloy with a mixture of aluminium, nickel and cobalt. Hence the name Alneco. The proportion of these three blended elements determines the properties the magnet will have. We label these blends with numbers. Alneco 2 and 5 are the most common and used in the original Strat and PEF pickups respectively, but also 3, 4, 8 and other variants also exist. 3 is technically the weakest of the Alnecos. 8 is the most powerful, but with much of the character of an Alneco 2, making it a great choice for a powerful humbucker, but with a classic character. 4 is basically a slightly weaker 5, and it's often used in PAF recreations as it replicates the slight weakening an Alnico 5 magnet would have experienced between the 1950s and now. Alnico magnets are widely considered to give a pickup a mellow character, with each blend influencing the tonality in subtly different ways. For example, the stronger the magnet, the more the high end of the pickup will be emphasised. Ceramic magnets are used in one of two places. On most very cheap pickups, like the ones found in budget Eastern made guitars. Ceramic bars are cheaper than Alneco rods, so it's cost effective simply to glue a ceramic bar to the back of some iron slugs. Although ceramic magnets are more powerful and harsher sounding than Alneco, so it makes these cheap single coils sound harsh in the high end and lack character or detail. Ceramic magnets are also a popular choice in high output humbuckers because the stronger magnet not only increases the output level but can help prevent the overwound coil sounding too dark. This once again is trading detail and character for raw power. On the right coil they work well but I'm not generally a fan of ceramic magnets in pickups. I said before that pull pieces are the eyes of the pickup and determine how it will see the strings. Their purpose is to focus the magnetic field into a specific shape to sense the strings in a specific way. Most pickups will have pull pieces directly under the string, which makes complete sense. A narrow pole will have a narrow tall focus, while a big wide pole will distribute the field over a wider area. 
Rails will distribute the field evenly with no weak spots between the strings, giving the most even volume response for wide bends, but the pickup needs to be closer to the strings to compensate for the shallower field distribution. Hex heads tend to sound a little more precise, while big dome screws are loud bludgeoning devices, but less precise. In the case of single coils with individual rod magnets per string, the advantage here is the ability to have different magnetic strength per string. Fender do this on many of their pickups now, a mix of Alnico blends to fine tune the response of each individual string. Do base plates and covers make a difference to the sound of the pickup? Absolutely they do, and I'm going to explain the science of why. Let's start with steel base plates. We see these on single coils sometimes, most notably Fender Telecaster and Jaguar pickups. The Jag is the most interesting one because the base plate extends up the sides with a distinctive toothed shape. Steel is a magnetic material. It will interact with the magnet in the pickup, redistribute the magnetic field through itself and ultimately change how the pickup senses the strings. These are used to reinforce certain frequencies in a single coil, taming the high transients, extending the low end and making them sound more substantial than they really are. The Jag style is effectively creating a new pair of pole pieces to view the strings with. Steel will have a drastic effect, but other materials do it in a more subtle way. When it comes to humbuckers, there are typically two different base plate materials, nickel silver and brass. Neither of these materials are magnetic. A magnet won't stick to them and they won't channel the magnetic field away from the pole pieces. Nickel silver effectively won't interact with the magnet at all. It's an incredibly magnetically invisible material, so if you don't want to change anything about how the coil and the magnet interact, nickel silver is the top choice. A lot of pickup makers, including myself, like to use brass for at least some of the pickups that we produce. While brass can't be magnetised, that doesn't mean it can't be influenced by a magnetic field moving in its presence. When a magnetic field moves across brass, something interesting happens. Tiny vortexes of charge start to spin in the material. These eddy currents induced in the brass generate their own magnetic field in opposition to the one that created the eddies in the first place. Now, that might sound ridiculous until you consider what brass is made from. Brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. Copper, where else do we use that in a pickup? That's right, in the coil. The coil which, when in the presence of a moving magnetic field, generates a current. Brass has many of the same properties as copper, and if the strings moving in the pickup's magnetic field can generate a current in the copper coil, so too can it generate tiny vortexes of current in the brass. Here's a demonstration of this in action. I have a powerful rare earth magnet which I'm releasing down a sloped wooden board. Wood cannot interact with a magnet, and so the magnet falls under gravity unimpeded. Let me replace the wood with a sheet of brass. Remember, the brass isn't magnetic. A magnet does not stick to brass, but when I drop the magnet, the rate of descent down the slope is significantly slower. Why? Because as the magnet falls, its field changes relative to the brass. This introduces tiny currents in the brass. These currents generate their own opposing magnetic field. All of this energy required to create the currents has to come from somewhere, and the only available energy source is the kinetic energy of the falling magnet. The interaction between brass and the magnet is significant enough to literally combat Earth's gravity and slow the magnet as it falls. What has this got to do with pickups? Well, the brass base plate will be capable of sapping energy from the pickup in a dynamic fashion as the strings move. This will affect the overall inductance of the pickup as you play, and you have a pickup that sort of responds to what you are playing in a subtle way. The same rules apply to covers. You are encasing the entire coil in metal. How transparent that metal is to a magnetic field will change how the pickup views the strings. There's also the factor with covers that the coil will sit slightly lower compared to the strings, at least by the thickness of the cover. It may also change the relative distance between the coils and the pole pieces. It's a tiny change, but removing the covers can make the pickup sound a little hotter and more aggressive, though mostly the covers are an aesthetic and shielding choice more than a sonic one. After a pickup has been fully wound, it's a very good idea to submerge the whole thing in a bath of liquid wax. I'm using a blend of paraffin and beeswax for my potting material. Submerging the pickups until all the bubbles cease rising ensures that the liquid wax permeates all available gaps and airspace left in the pickup. 
When the pickup is removed and left to cool, the wax will solidify inside the pickup, consolidating all of the internal parts, preventing any loose coils, spacers or covers from flexing, rattling or moving independently from the whole unit. Parts internal to the pickup moving and vibrating independently of the hole will generate unwanted noise in the pickup and cause feedback which is impossible to tame. These microphonic effects are undesirable to all but the absolute weirdos who make every excuse for them on the basis of it being the correct vintage sound. Pickup manufacturers only didn't pop pickups at the beginning because they overlooked the fact. It wasn't a stylistic choice to get a more open sound from the coil. They cut corners, the pickups were noisy, then they started potting the coils. Simple as that. Here are a few last things before people start to cry about it in the comments. Active pickups are all specially wound humbuckers with an onboard preamp. The signal level from the coil is amplified by a tiny little circuit board and then sent out from the pickup. All of these additional electronics are epoxied into a plastic cover. They require batteries, that's what active means, and need lower value potentiometers due to their lower impedance. What about X type of pickup? Look, this video is long enough without going into the tiny design differences between Filtertrons, Goldfoss, and any other specific thing from a specific brand. All of what I've covered here is relevant to all types of pickup, even the likes of a Fishman Fluence which uses printed circuits layered together to form its coil and enabling exactly the same coil every single time. That's a lot of pickup stuff covered and hopefully it's given you some insight into the complexities behind what may seem on the face of it a very simple device. As I said up top, this guitar isn't quite finished yet and if you want to hear this in action make sure you're subscribed and you'll get notified when it's ready to go. Don't forget to click all the buttons you're supposed to to make this video viable to the ever-changing whims of the YouTube algorithm. That's all for now. Keep it loud and stay safe. Boop.